Hey guys, on this episode, we have Rish Gupta, co-founder and head of product at Spot AI. Rish has successfully started two companies with a customer first mantra. So we asked him to be on the show to share his perspective on how to be successful, putting the customer first over efficiency. Without further ado, enjoy the show. Hey everybody, welcome to Manufacturing Unscripted. I'm your host, Matt Rawl. Today I'm joined with Rish Gupta. Uh, he's the co-founder and head of product at Spot AI. Reese, how are you doing? Good. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Excited yeah. to have this conversation. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you joining the show. Um, I guess let's get, get started right away. Uh, you're a first time guest, so uh, I'd love to know more about you and, and kind of uh, how you got started uh, in your career and, and how you kind of ended up where you are today. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I grew up, you know, I live in San Francisco right mm -hmm. now, but I grew up in India, in New Delhi. Um, which, and, and from a very young age, what excited me was, you know, just the idea of having my own thing or starting my own company and entrepreneurship in general. So I started my first company is when I was 22, 23 uh, out of India, which was a platform which connected students and colleges, uh, students and companies, kind of a LinkedIn slash uh, a job platform. It ended up becoming the largest in the country and I sold it after five years. And and with that, I kind of decided to move to San Francisco, saying seeing all the technology action was happening in Silicon Valley, and and with the idea of kind of building something new. Uh, what really got me interested and in what led me to Spot AI is one of the interesting trends happening in the world from a technology perspective was the number of you know personal computers that we use is is has been steady at about two billion in the in the world. Mm -hmm. The number of mobile phones are already at about six billion units. You know, which is very close to the number of people alive. Uh, <clears throat> but the number of devices, which was increasing at a phenomenal rate more than anything else, was internet connected devices. So, you know, everybody has seen it in their homes, in their cars. You know, any factory setup, manufacturing setup has getting more and more things connected to the cloud. And, and so that was an opportunity, which was like the number of internet connected devices is going to go from billions to hundreds of billions on the internet side of, uh, of things, side of things. Yep. So, which is where I got interested in that space. And as I dug deep, you know, we went deeper. One of the things that really stood out was videos because nothing gives a more complete picture of what's happening in physical operations than actually being able to see what's happening. And there were multiple trends and we can kind of dig into that if, you know, if the conversation goes there or why yeah. business is adopting that more and more. So that led us to Spot AI where we believe that, you know, the future in 10 years from now, there'll be not a single business which will not be able to pull up a video footage to understand how the business is, is doing, how the manufacturing plant is working, how a you know, slip and fall accident happened or a worker compensation claim and, and, and being able to kind of have the evidence to navigate those uh, things or have safety training videos and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just about to ask you if you had so many like good examples, but you just kind of rail it off uh, some good ones right there that um, definitely uh, help protect you know, not just the company, but also the employees, you know, with yeah. having that video evidence. Yeah. And it helps employees also have, you know, the, the whole purpose of being able to put these videos, not just in the hands of owners, but actual, you know, operators and employees so that they can see when something is going on. You know, you don't have to walk the entire floor of a mm -hmm. massive warehouse or manufacturing plant. You can pull up, you know, video footage of what's happening in different places. If something went wrong yesterday on your line, you can actually go and see it yourself. Uh, you know, so there's, yeah, yeah, there's tons I, of examples. And, yeah. Yeah. We have, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of based in the Detroit area. So a lot of the automakers are here and a lot of uh, auto yeah. plants and, and there's the old school, you know, assembly line plants that are a mile long. Right. And, yeah. and I can imagine, you know, there are some people that are probably having yeah. to walk that multiple times a day just to yeah. check something. So having that video evidence um, and that video there as a as a, uh, a vessel or whatever to see what's going on definitely would probably save them time and, you know, could offer them to the ability to do other more productive things for, for the employer. Yeah. We have, I think, not far from you guys, we have a company called Clock Manufacturing Systems, mm -hmm. which is based out of Michigan, which actually uses us for very similar reasons. If you know a part is defected or something, they can actually go back to the video of the line when it's being produced and see what what was going wrong. That's great. So yeah. Uh, another question I have, semi-related, but just more, I guess, 
growing up um, uh, in India and then coming to the U.S., what's it's what's one of the the <laughs> the, the most uh, eye opening things you've seen when you now that you've been in the U.S. Yeah, I've been here since I think 2014, so it's been eight years. Yeah, um, 2015. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think the most, you know, the things that get difficult or things that are just just surprising are not the big things. Yeah, it, it's it's the small things. It's it's when you go to the grocery store and you find there are 10,000 options for cheeses, which no other country <laughs> in the world has. And you're like, how many milks do I need to choose from? And and yeah. then you just stand in a grocery store for 10 minutes saying, how will I ever get through this? Yeah, we... And these simple things like that, which, which, or, you know, going to a restaurant, uh, you know, restaurant and, and mm-hmm. you, you have different words in different parts of the world. Yeah. Like, for example, restrooms or bathrooms are really common as a word mm-hmm. in the US. In the British English, the word loo is really common. So I would sometimes find myself in restaurants asking, where's the loo? And they'll look at me as if, I'm speaking a completely different language. So simple things like yeah. those, which are surprising. And the and, and I think on the business side, what's really interesting is uh, there is not, like I've worked in Europe and I've worked in Asia. I think US provides a unique landscape where there's actually a massive set of, you know, huge country which operates, even though, you know, we have this political divide and all this stuff, but operates on pretty much common principles. So you can have a McDonald's open in one part of the, country and then slowly very quickly expand to the entire country and you can have yep. you know common retail outlets and burger chains which is almost impossible like a german but chain does not go to switzerland and and yeah. vice versa and same thing in asia so it, yeah. it's pretty fascinating the landscape that yeah. the us provides to build yeah it's it's funny that you mentioned cheese because you say all the different types of cheese and i it it's funny because we have things in the cheese aisle that are technically not cheese that we <laughs> sell as cheese you know and yeah. so so yeah, I guess it's it's not something that you know I've been in the U.S. my whole life. You know, I, I yeah. have traveled outside, but I don't think you see those types of things like subtleties, and unless you're like really yeah. living it, you know. Yeah. I go yeah. places and I just think, oh, they don't have many cheese options, just because maybe this is not a high uh, or populated space, so they just have select yeah. cheeses, which is like that in some parts of the U.S., but. You know, it's probably that's all the cheese that they have because, you know, they're not <laughs> yeah. they're not insane like like people in the U.S. Um, yeah, it's just more choices. Yep, yep. All right. Well, um, so I wanted to bring you on to talk about uh, how to operationalize customer first culture. Uh, I know you've, as you mentioned, you've been part of and founded a a, a couple companies now, and and I'm sure you know both of them do tend to be geared towards making uh the user or the 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 customer life a little bit easier and so it seems like you are kind of geared uh towards that type of business um and so you know you're a firm believer in the customer first mantra absolutely Um, can you share more about how your philosophy of improving internal operation to help enhance the customer experience has helped your business thrive yeah and i think the the you know, customer first is something is is it is one of those buzzwords which every company uses. Mm-hmm. So if if you know you go to most companies in the value system, they will have something which you know tells them how they want to add value to their end customer. Uh, the how or the mechanics of it is co- very often missing. Uh, and and <clears throat> over the years of kind of building these technology companies and and being in customer first environments uh, and trying to cultivate them, there are a few things that I've realized which helps the mechanics of it. The number one is whichever business team you're a part of, whether you have the product and engineering teams or you have a customer sales team or you have a support team, whatever team, you know, on a team that you might be talking to, the, the fundamental question you should pose to them as leaders or as, as managers of those teams is how does our team add value to the customer? Like what are we doing which actually moves the needle for the customer and how can we provide more value? And it's very different than how can I make more money out of the customer? Yep. And and so if 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 each team is constantly thinking about this question, the way I frame it from a team is that the dollar that a customer is going to spend with us, can we provide more value for the same dollar tomorrow and day after tomorrow and the next year and the next year? And if there's a path for that, then then we are a customer first company because mm-hmm. we're saying you spend the same amount of dollars. How can I give you more for that? Yep. And if if the best companies in the world, if you see, give you more for the dollar every progressive year. Mm-hmm. They they make 
you know, <clears throat> um, they improve the product and they, they keep making things better or cheaper or, you know, whether it's Amazon or Walmart yeah. or whatever else. Uh, <clears throat> that's the number one question. And each team can articulate things. If you're a sales team, you could think about how you can make the sales process easier, the number of touch points easier. You can make, oh, the customers are normally looking for this information. Can we give them upfront? Can we put it on a website? Can Like, how is a customer getting value? And and how can I reduce, uh, how can I increase that value? The, the second is normally, very often we build whatever you're building, you build a great product, you have a tool or a system that you're selling to another company. Uh, there is a certain friction that a customer has in either buying that product or using that product or min maintaining that product. Uh, so the second question I always ask teams is to answer is like, what is the friction that the customer faces in getting the value that you're building for them? And are there ways we can take off that friction? And, you know, uh, like one of the, s s you know, biggest examples of to me and the simplest examples is going back to Amazon in 2004, they, that was the first time they implemented the single click checkout button. Yep. And back then the biggest friction is I want to buy this product, but I have to enter all this information every time, whether it's my credit card information or my address. And by clicking that one click button was, it's a simple thing, but it phenomenally changed, reduced the number of steps a person had to do to do something mm -hmm. they wanted to get to. Uh, and obviously it creates a lot of value for them. So constantly thinking what is, that is creating friction for the customer and what can we do to remove that barrier for them? Uh, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, that you say that button, I, that button actually scares me a little bit uh, just because <laughs> of how easy they made it. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, my impulse buying and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I, 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 I definitely see what you mean. You know, I, a lot of the devices that I use today, um, you know, it's, it's all about the quality of life for me, right? You know, yeah. uh, you know, I use certain devices that people are like, yeah, I would never use those. I'm, you know, I, I don't like that company. You know, why do you yeah. use it? And I say, you know, these are everyday devices that I use and I pick the one that is best for my quality of life. You know, um, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, we're, I'm an engineer in what I do yep. and I, I do a lot of more advanced stuff and I, 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 have a lot of high tech stuff that I deal with. When I go home, I don't want to deal with all that stuff. I just want stuff that's easy, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and and if they can make my life easier, um, and and the people around me, it's easier to communicate with them. Then yeah. yes, I'm I'm on board, and I would and I would pay more for that, you know, that that level of that just quality of life, you know, yeah. I, I'm willing to pay for because it just again it makes things easier, and there's. And there's just less less for me to do. Yeah, and, and the beauty is that if you remove frictions from the process, yeah. as you said, it improves the quality of your life when you consume the product. If you're a business user, it improves your you know that whole interaction process. That uh, and, and then you're less likely to go to find another vendor or another mm -hmm. company to do business with because you're very happy. And if you go to another person, you would see the frictions, and those will scare you when you're like, I'm actually pretty happy where I am because. Yeah you know, those, those points. And I think the fundamental as managers and people leading teams is you, you have to start a lot of your meetings with these questions and, and constantly asking like, what is the best for the customer with these two lenses? Are we adding more value or are we removing more friction? And if either of those things are not true, like, is it this a really important thing that we should be building or doing? What, what are uh, some of like the more common um, like hurdles that you see when you're trying to implement like this process to someone for let's say the first time? The, the, the biggest hurdle yeah. is most managers and most people who have had some amount of work experience are always trying to drive efficiency. Mm -hmm. And that's a very common theme that you're trying to be more productive or you're trying to make your teams do more and make your dollars go more internally. And very often the question of what will make it easier for the customer or what will remove friction seems an inefficient way of organizing your team or organizing your hours. And it's not obvious how you can drive efficiency and this both. And so you will get the initial pushbacks from the system if you're if you're already up walking into an existing company, existing yeah. set of you know culture and policies, uh, is that 
oh, the way we do things is the most efficient way of doing things or it allows for certain efficiency. And this disrupts that. Mm -hmm. This allow and and that's the biggest hurdle you fail when you start implementing these things. The the beauty is that if you're able to kind of get past that hurdle, you actually see that efficiency actually improves over a period of time after slightly going down in the beginning because you're changing the way you work because you realize that suddenly all departments and different set of people have a more common unified goal around the customer rather than their own efficiency or their own department. And, and okay. yeah. And yeah. So that is then able to organize teams and people around new goals and in a much more productive way. Uh, do you, um, for those like first time uh, implementers, um, yeah. how, what type of strategies or, or methods have you seen them use that have been successful? I, I think the biggest thing is you need, uh, if you're not in the C-suite yourself, you need your leaders to kind of buy in because otherwise, when you see that initial dip of productivity or in, in, initial dip of efficiency in some ways, you're going to get a pushback from the mm -hmm. top. Or, or So getting the management buy-in in, into things like this or the management has to be 100% bought in that, hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's the cost of it in the near term that the company might have to bear. And, and but if these external metrics eventually improve on a six month or one year timeline, yeah. we, this project is a success. And I think having that buy-in discussion or getting other people to buy in is, mm -hmm. is the first thing because otherwise, you know, the first month is, is going to look scary. For example, when we built a technical support team, yep. The typical way you run a technical support team is you maximize for the number of tickets they can solve. So the typical support team will have metrics around the number of support tickets per person solved and how much time did they take and can they reduce the number of time, how many open tickets are there. So very often if you've dealt with any customer service across the board, you would see that if you don't respond to the email for two days, they're like, oh, we haven't heard from you, so we're going to close this ticket and mm -hmm. because they're trying to meet the internal metrics of all tickets solved. So they, they create this artificial way of saying, Matt hasn't responded to me for three days, so I'll yep. just assume his problem is gone, yep. even though Matt has said nothing about his problem being gone, and I'm going to close it. The internal metrics look good. Everybody looks really efficient and, and productive. But if you orient yourselves about saying, no, we, we, we're not going to use the same metrics. We're going to think about how, how many more customers can we get to saying they really loved our service and how, what percentage of customers will say that because we know if customers love our product, they're going to eventually recommend it to other people, buy more of it, not go and look for other vendors, not going to cancel our subscription. And, and it plays out in a slightly longer time frame. but you need to be able to will, willing to make that investment, which means that ticket stays open. Yeah. Somebody has to keep responding to Matt saying, hey, Matt, I haven't heard from you yeah. in four days. Are you happy? Are you not happy? Can you give us a thumbs up, thumbs down? And, and follows up until we get an answer, right? And some, some people may not respond and you create metric like benchmarks around it. But it's a different way of kind of running a team and, and, and finding different metrics which drive the business. Yeah, and, and I'm sure, you know, and maybe, you know, I'm gonna try to tie in Spot AI into this a little bit yeah. in that, you know, as you're, you're making these internal changes, I'm sure there's a lot of things you know, I, and I've mentioned on the show before, there, there's a saying that we use here, and it's one of the worst sayings a company can, can say is, is, is we've always done it that way. You know, and so yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of self-evaluation like that where they're, you know, you're, they're saying don't just, you know, close it because they don't say anything. No, we need to kind of, you know, follow up with them, make sure they're taken care of. You know, maybe, maybe something else distracted them, but this is still an issue. You know, yeah. is there stuff – um, through Spot AI and and the the product that you offer, that um, can help like the the management side um, make better business decisions. So one of the things that we do, which helps you know in in some regards with this, is yeah, uh, is there are a couple like there are a couple of things. One is your, your frontline people who mm -hmm. talk to the customers, whether it's your salespeople or you have a support team or whatever you might have to do, or sales engineers, whoever is talking to these, these, these uh, you know, end customers, they hold the perception of, like they hold the key to the perception of your company. 
And uh, if you can, like we allow for, especially if it's a retail environment or any environment where the camera is present, where the customer is and the, and the person is interacting, we allow for those videos to be captured in a training format and actually give annotations and comments and threads, just like you would do on a Slack thread or a mm -hmm. Microsoft Teams thread. And, but be able to tag and annotate real-time videos uh, so that you are able to point out what are the good and the bad of, of the, this, um, uh, you know, of, of like dealing with certain customers or, or behaviors that you want to uplift. And I think having the visuals as training modules be available to future people, not just in terms of somebody recorded a, you know, a demo training, you know, yeah. very often you would do a demo stuff, which yep. is nothing like a real interaction where you have a scripted demo versus actually seeing real interaction and seeing where people could have done better, what the right examples are, where people did not do as well, really helps. The second is there are some analytics we provide around if you have um, uh, uh, you know, any kind of a kiosk where a person interacts with your end customers, mm -hmm. or if you require certain people to be present at certain places for better service, it it counts the people presence all of time. So you can say between nine to five, how much time was this this there was a per human being here to actually serve the customers, or how many how much what percentage of time was the person here actually looking at the manufacturing line to make sure the quality inspections were being done. So we provide these things with, which data and analytics on top of video to help you understand how people are interacting with your systems or customers. Yeah, we, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, the cameras and, and I believe you guys offer the camera, right? And, and I'm yeah. sure this is more than just the cliche security camera footage um, that you see in movies. Um, uh, you know, as we're, you know, video has advanced, I'm sure to, in order to use these as training videos, you guys are supplying a pretty high-end camera. So the, the beauty is that, uh, you know, cameras today are, have, you know, you can buy a $650 camera, a $100 uh -huh. camera, which is going to be pretty, pretty good because yep. the camera prices have come down significantly. So, and, and the beauty of everything is today in software. So uh, it's not about the, the, you know, the hardware specs of the yep. camera. Most decent cameras are going to ca capture five megapixel 4K, yep. you know, footage. And then it depends on what you do on the software side to analyze those videos to, and, and so yep. the cameras itself for us are not a differentiator in, in this market. Yep. Uh, it's, it's what you do on the software side. Okay. And, and then as you mentioned software, cause we've had a lot of conversation on the show about industry 4.0 and that data. Um, I guess, are you guys doing anything on your side? Cause you've talked about analyzing data, creating internal videos. So I'm sure there's going to be a level of, you know, protection that you're going to want to offer with those videos. Um, do you guys oh, offer yeah. anything like that? In terms of privacy of the yes. videos and making sure, yeah. yeah. Oh, this is something that, you know, is, is a big trend with videos mm -hmm. is, is how do you make sure that those are not getting leaked out? These are your videos of your entire manufacturing operations and your businesses and, you know, could have a lot of private information. In yeah. There. So one, there's a bunch of things, you know, apart from encrypting the videos and the video tunnels to make sure that, you know, anybody who gets just access to the path is not able to just, if he gets access to a raw file, they're not just able to see it. They yep. need the encryption keys. We also make sure that our videos is stored and, and indexed behind on the premises of these businesses. So it's behind their firewalls. It's not in some cloud somewhere else. It's actually on the premises behind okay. the firewall. Third, we, uh, very clearly, you know, use some of, the, some of the latest security kind of audits and security measures to make sure that everything from the way the video is getting stored, analyzed, indexed, is 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 uh, basically secure and and not uh, uh, susceptible to external threats. And finally, um, we don't do certain things like facial recognition and yeah. other personal identifiable information. So you can't. For example, uh, go and search, you know, your photo, and then be like, "Give me all the videos where Matt was just yeah. walking around my factory." And, and that was gonna be my last question before I kind of open it up to anything you want to talk about. Was is how do you fight that uh, that that tendency of people to kind of look at this and say it's a little too big brothery, you know? Yeah. And 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 sell it as this is a tool to like improve efficiency and make it better for both the worker and the employer um, without yeah. it looking like I'm going to watch everything you're doing. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, the thing with Big Brother or any technology is like, when you are on Facebook or you mm -hmm. are on Instagram or whatever, you don't know what all information is being captured about you. And, and that creates that sense of Big Brother. It's yeah. like, oh, Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg might have all this data about me and, and, and they know what I'm doing and what I'm trying to buy and what I'm trying to search. Uh, the way we have designed our system is we plug into your Gmail suite or Microsoft Teams suite or whatever, you know, organizational email suite that you're using for managing your, you, you know, Teams logins. And we give access to this to every, every team member. So we don't yeah. charge per seat. We don't do those things. So everybody can get access to the videos. And since everybody knows what exactly is being recorded and they have access to the videos on their phone, they know that what is, where are the cameras, what is being seen, what actions are being taken. It's, it's not that a small set of people have access to this information yeah. and the teams don't. It's the, we, we basically work with our, you know, customers to make sure that that organization are getting onboarded and everybody has access to teams and then we make sure that we don't build things like uh you know facial recognition and other personal yep. identifiable information for example we we're building something with license plates but we're not going to allow anybody to search like let's say half a license plate yep. and get the full number because then they can find your address and then they can yep. do other things it's like no they, they, they can't uh so we got private information uh away from, we don't even like capture it. We don't yeah. even store and, it. And I think that's good too, that you you open it up to everybody, right? Because um, I think as everyone can see exactly what you're capturing and, and doing, yeah. that they're more likely to to get on board and, and kind of really embrace what you're trying to accomplish, you know, as the employer, you know, and that customer first mentality. Yeah, I think with with you know, kind of circling back to customer yeah. first mentality, is you know to build a customer first organization. One of the things you know, once you've got the pillars of how do we add more value to customers and how do we keep reducing friction every year, every quarter, you have to also think about how do you make information accessible to all the people making decisions. Mm -hmm. If a small set of people are making decisions, it's difficult for a small set of people to have all the customer context. Uh, so. Yeah, how do you make more and more information available to your last mile of your employee base is super critical. Yep. Um, well, well, Reese, uh, um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do want to open up. Uh, is there um, anything you'd like to talk about more about um, or, or, or want to mention about that customer first culture that seems like, you know, you've been very successful in implementing several times or anything else about Spot AI that you wanted to uh, briefly discuss? I think on, on the customer first side, the, the only last thing I would like to say is that it, it is one of those things that once you start repeating again and again, and you start building those muscles in every meeting, and that's why I keep saying that it has to, a lot of meetings have to start with, how are we doing one of those two things for our customer adding more value? What happens is when you're not in the room, when the new team member joins, when, when a, you know, something in the plant is not going right, mm -hmm. what are the key decisions to make? every member of the team will make those decisions with those two lenses saying, Hey, what's right for the customer. Yep. What should, and, and, and then getting to that final cultural mindset is, is what victory is because then all the small decisions to big decisions start getting made from those lens and it creates a really powerful organization. So reputation is, is kind of the key in, in driving this in every meeting, every kind of opportunity that people get, uh, uh, on Spot AI, I think any of your customers, uh, any of your <laughs> listeners listening yeah. to it, is 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 interested in how videos can affect or impact their businesses, physical operations. Just visit our website, give us a shout out. We'll be more than happy to chat. Yeah, and with that, obviously everything, uh, Reese's contact and Spot AI's contact, will definitely all be in the notes. So feel free to check that out. And and Reese, thank you so much for joining the show. Uh, thank hey, you. Thanks, man. Yeah, and thank you to all the listeners. Until next time. This podcast was brought to you by Promise Incorporated, hosted by Matthew Rawl, produced by myself, Lauren Rawl, mixed and edited by Ben Parsons. Please make sure to subscribe and rate this podcast. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at podcast at promiseinc.com.